So, um, hello. Well, welcome to my talk on, on writing a Kubernetes operator in Java. Um, my name is Fabian, so this is the uh, tools in action session, and so I think uh, in action means you want to actually see the code, and so I'm going to try to do as much live coding as possible, and I think if you see the code and see what it does, you also will get an understanding what operators do in general and how you could apply this in your own projects. Um, a few words of introduction. Um, what is an operator, actually? So um, I think every one of you knows what Kubernetes is. Kubernetes is a runtime platform for Docker containers. And Kubernetes does a lot of things out of the box. So basically, if you have a Docker image and you want three instances of this image running, then all you need to do in Kubernetes, you create your deployment descriptor, specify the number of replicas should be three, and then Kubernetes will schedule three pods for you. And this is uh, good and enough for a lot of applications, but there are applications where this is not enough. And if you read the texts about operators, then uh, the generic example that you often see is imagine a distributed key value store. So you might have configured your key value store with three instances running in Kubernetes, and all of a sudden an instance dies. What Kubernetes can do for you, Kubernetes can see that the pod has crashed and schedule a new pod for you. But maybe that's not enough. Maybe you need to reconfigure the instances and tell them that one instance has left the cluster and another instance has joined the cluster. Or maybe you have to trigger a job to make the two remaining instances move data over to the new instance so that the new instance can start serving key value data. Things like that. There might be tasks specific to your application that need to be done on top of what uh, Kubernetes does out of the box. And if you have something like that, it might be a good idea to write your own operator. So an operator is basically it's a piece of software running in Kubernetes as a regular deployment or whatever. And this piece of software takes care of operating an application for you. And of course, the operator uses everything that Kubernetes provides out of the box. But in addition to that, with an operator, you have the opportunity to also implement application-specific tasks that Kubernetes, of course, cannot provide out of the box. Right? So um, a few words uh, about me. So what, what do I have to do with it? Why am I here? Um, I'm Fabian. I work for Instana. Instana is a monitoring company. So we have an application monitoring product with a focus on monitoring dynamic microservice applications. And of course, Kubernetes is one of the most important platforms we support. And if you want to install our Instana monitoring agent in your Kubernetes cluster, then one way to do it is to try this uh, Instana agent operator. Um, and this operator is actually uh, um, open source on GitHub, so you can even read the, so the source code. So if you, after the talk, want to see a bit of a more complete example based on the same ideas that I'm going to show you today, then you might uh, check this out and read the source code. And I'm one of the people who wrote this operator. Okay? So um, let's get started. Let's uh, write some, some operator code. Um, as a framework, I am going to use Quarkus. Um, there were a lot of Quarkus talks or GraalVM talks already, so I'm not going to get too much into it. So <laughs> um, if you're interested why Quarkus might be a good idea to, to use um, if you want to run your software in Kubernetes, maybe listen to the second hour of today's deep dive for GraalVM. It was explained pretty well. And <clears throat> so I'm going to use Quarkus for my demo. And the, um, I'm going to use a client library for communicating with the Kubernetes API server. And this client, client library is called the Fabricate Kubernetes client. And this page here, uh, code.quarkus.io, is kind of a getting started page, page where you can just select dependencies that you want and download a zip file with a sample application. So if I, for example, select the Kubernetes client here, like this, and then download it, and then um, I would end up with an like example hello REST service with this dependency in my POM XML. Okay, good. So let's get started. Um, the first version of our like hello world operator that I'm going to write is a little application that simply lists and watches pods. So when you install it, it will initially get a list of all pods running in its own namespace, and then it will start watching for changes. So when a new pod is added, when a pod is modified, when a pod is elite, deleted, etc. Okay. In order to do that, uh, the first thing I need from this uh, Kubernetes client library, I need to create an instance, a, a client object 
that I can use to communicate with the API server. So I'm just writing a simple like, client uh, producer Java class. And um, as I have said, uh, the like, intention is to list and watch uh, pods in my own namespace. So the first thing we need to figure out is uh, what namespace are we actually running in. So uh, find my current namespace like this. So basically, what, what we want to do, we want to write this uh, Java method. And when we compile this, put it in a Docker image, ship it to Kubernetes, and run it there, then with, when this method is called, it should return the namespace it is running in. How can one implement something like that? There is actually a trick, and the trick is a magic file. It's called var run secrets Kubernetes IO service account namespace. And this is basically a text file with just a single string in it, which is the current namespace. And that's kind of a generic example for how many things related to auto configuration in Kubernetes work. It's mostly it's either magic files or magic environment variables. And if you just read this into a string, we can know what namespace we are running in. OK? Oh, no, that's not. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Just wanted this exception can I think it can never happen. I, I never saw it really. So let's just add it to the method signature here. And I'm going to use um, CDI to set up my application, which is not too important for for this uh, demo. But you know you could use any other way if if you like. But with CDI you would just say produces a singleton uh, named named namespace, and then you can use this string as a in your dependency injection, okay? Good, and with this, it's of course easy to produce a singleton uh, Kubernetes client, make a default client. I take the namespace as parameter here, and I just return, return a new default Kubernetes client in namespace, namespace. So this is basically the, the boilerplate code to get your Kubernetes client up and running. So um, let's now go ahead and actually list and watch pods. So I'm going to create a new Java class and call it uh, pod lister watcher, something like this, maybe a stupid name, I don't know. And of course, we are going to, to inject our Kubernetes client that we just created here. And now the first thing we want to do on application startup, we want to get a list of all pods in our namespace. So first question, how do we even run something on application startup? That's of course specific to what framework you're using, like on startup. With CDI, the trick is to observe a startup event like this. And this is just a way of telling the framework to, to run this um, method when the application starts, starts. Of course, if you have any other framework, you have other ways to do this. And now we can simply call client pods list. What this will do, it will create, uh, will do an HTTPS request to the Kubernetes API server and request a pod list for the namespace we configured the client with. And the API server will, of course, respond with a pod list. We can convert this pod list into an actual Java list by uh, calling get items, and then we get a list of pod, like a list with metadata about the pods in this namespace. Um, let's just uh, print this list so that we see what we got. So for pod, pod in our list, uh, let's say found pod with Let's print the, the pod name, name equals pod get metadata get name. And let's print the version, version equals um, pod get metadata get resource version. So um, name, I think, is trivial. It's the name of the pod that we found. Resource version might be something that you haven't heard of, but um, I think it's important to know about resource versions when when you want to write your own operator. And so I'm just going to print it for now. And then we, when we run this example and see what it does, I will get back to it and tell you why this uh, might be important to know about this. OK, good. And now, uh, like, like this gives us an initial snapshot, a list of pods in our namespace. And the next thing we are going to do is we're going to say client pods watch. So what, what watch will do 
It will create a WebSocket connection to the Kubernetes API server and subscribe to be notified whenever anything related to pods in that namespace happens. For example, when a new pod is added, when a pod is deleted, when a pod is modified. Modified is mostly changing its status. For example, it goes from container creating to running or from running to terminating and things like these. And, and whenever something like that happens, the API server will push updated metadata about this pod through this WebSocket connection to our client. And this watch method has a callback as parameter. It's called a new watcher. And it has two methods here, event received and on closed. And in event received, we can just uh, print what we got. So uh, received action event. So action is actually an enum. It's something like edit, modified, deleted. And we can just print it so that we see what it is and then just copy and paste the information from above so that we also print the name and the version, right? And on close, there are actually two ways how on close can be called. First, you can call it explicitly. If you, in your business logic, decide that you do no longer want to, to be notified about uh, events, and then on close will be called with parameter null. And if this exception that we get as parameter is not null, that means it was closed exceptionally. That means I don't know, either networking problems or permission errors or something like that happened. And this is basically something you cannot recover from. There's not much you can do about it. And so it's a good idea, I mean, maybe first to print the stack trace so that you have a chance to see what went wrong, but then to call um, system exit. So it's generally, like as a general rule, if you write software that's supposed to run in Kubernetes, and this software encounters an error where you cannot recover from, it's a, it's a good idea to call system exit to terminate the JVM, because what will happen then is, of course, your pod will crash, and this will uh, make Kubernetes schedule a new pod for you. And if it was just a networking problem, and maybe the new pod is then scheduled to another host, it might even fix the problem. And if it's a permanent error, of course, the, the new pod will crash again, and then Kubernetes will try another one, and the new pod will crash again. And eventually, Kubernetes will put your process into this um, crash back of loop. And with uh, standard Kubernetes tools, you will immediately see that something is uh, uh, seriously going wrong with that pod. So it's, it's always a good idea. Um, if you have an error where you cannot recover from, to call system exit and terminate the process in order to signal to Kubernetes that something fatal has happened. Good. Um, let's run this. I'm going to try to uh, demo this uh, compilation to, to a static executable. So if, if you don't add to, an, uh, to a native executable, so with, um, with Borkus you have two ways how you could compile your thing. Either uh, you compile it to executable jar file or you compile it to a native executable. And I'm feeling lucky now, and I have a script that would take this code and compile it to a native executable. So while it is running, it will take a while. Uh, let's look at the, at the content of the script. Uh, let's turn this blinking off. So. What, what does it do while it is running in the lower window? Um, first of all, of course, we are going to list and watch pods, so it's a good idea to have a few pods running. Um, and I think everyone who regularly works with Kubernetes has their favorite Docker image that we always use if we just want to have a pod running and don't really care what it is. And I, have, uh, I all tend to use Nginx for that. And this uh, command line here uh, says that I'm just going to take the original Nginx Docker image from Docker Hub and I'm going to run it as a pod and call it Nginx1, right? And with copy and paste, I create an Nginx2 and Nginx3 and then I have three pods running. And then, of course, the next step would be to compile my application with Maven package. By default, the pomxml will produce an executable jar file. But in this pomxml, in the, in the uh, sample application, there's also an alternative profile for uh, compiling to native code, which is, can be activated with this minus p native flag. And this will like, invoke then a um, um, Quarkus uh, Maven plugin, which will use the Graal VM to compile the application to a native executable. And I do not have Graal VM installed on my laptop. And so that's why I'm using this flag here. So this basically tells the plugin, do not look for GraalVM locally on this laptop. Just download a Docker file with GraalVM in it, and then use this Docker file, uh, Docker image to um, to compile the application. 
So that, that way you can compile it without having like, to install GraalVM locally. So, and then we have a native executable, and then the next step should be easy, which is just putting it into a Docker image. It should especially be easy because in the sample application there's already a Docker file included that we can use to do this. However, there's one library missing in this Docker image that we need because what our application will do, our application will create an HTTPS connection to the API server. And in order to create HTTPS connections, we need a cryptography library, which is called libsunec.so. And this cryptography library is fortunately shipped as part of the GraalVM distribution. And so I have a little bit of a blob of shellcode that I'm just going to skip over. But what it does, it takes this library, uh, libsunec.so, copies it out of the GraalVM Docker image, and then modifies the Docker file and the Docker ignore file to make sure that this library is then included um, in, in the Docker image I'm building. Okay? Yeah, and once this is done, I can, of course, Docker build this thing and call it operator demo version 1. Then kind, so I have a local Kubernetes cluster running on my laptop. I set this Kubernetes cluster up with a tool called kind. And if you have this uh, kind cluster running, then kind load Docker image is the command to take my Docker image and load it into this virtual Kubernetes cluster that's running on my laptop. And then I deploy the application. And all of this takes a while, especially compiling to native code. So I ran it in the background, but now it's done. So fortunately, cube control get pods. We should see that we have a few pods running, which is good. And with cube cuddle logs minus f operator example, yay! We see a few things on application startup. Um, we found a pod named nginx1 and another pod nginx2 and nginx3 and so forth. And now maybe in the window below, we can play a little bit with it. Say cube cuddle delete pod. Nginx2, for example, and we get a few modified events because deleting a pod is associated with status changes. So it goes from running to terminating and, th and things like that. And eventually, when it is actually deleted, we get a deleted event. Okay, so this works. Um, maybe a few words about this uh, resource version now. If, if you look closely, you might be wondering um, this here is the output from the initial list operation when, when we started the application and, and pod nginx1 was already running when we listed all pods. And here, when we started watching, we still received an edit event for pod nginx1. So how can this be? How can we receive an edit event for a pod that's actually already running in the cluster? And the answer to this is Kubernetes has a cache of events that happened in the cluster. And as soon as I start watching, I will get all the events from the cache. And this actually makes programming a lot easier. I think it's a good idea because you cannot miss stuff if you have slight timing issues in your code, like if you were offline for a short time interval or something. For example, in the code that I just wrote, you might think, you know, you, you first list the pods, and then you start watching, and you might think there is a slight time interval after listing and before watching, when maybe a pod is created right in the middle between these two operations. You might miss that pod and not get any events when this is created, but there's no, no risk of missing anything here, right? As soon as you start watching, you get the events from the last five minutes anyway, and so you don't need to care about these little things, or also if you lose the connection and just reconnect and stuff like that. The downside is, of course, that you should be prepared to receive outdated events, and that's where the re resource version comes in. So we see here, pod nginx1 has resource version two, uh, 7252, and here we get an event with uh, version uh, um, 7252, and so we know that this is obviously something that we have already seen, and we can just ignore the event. So in, in a real-world application, you probably have some cache or some hash map or something where you just put all the, um, all the resources you're interested in. And whenever you receive an event, you would first quickly check the resource version. Is it actually newer than what I got in my cache? And only if it's newer, you update your cache and trigger your business logic. If the resource version coming in is older or the same than something that you have already seen, you can just ignore the event. Okay, good. So this is um, 
actually quite, quite a lot of the building blocks that you need to write your own operator. So we can figure out what namespace we are running in, we can initialize a client, we can list and watch, and we know about resource versions. And there's actually not, not much missing to go from, from this here to an actual useful operator. And the, the one big thing that's actually missing is custom resources. So for the rest of this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about custom resources. Let's just look at one. Um, so we all know built-in resources, which are pods, deployments, config maps, secrets, whatever Kubernetes supports, right? And just the same way as you can apply those uh, built-in resources to your Kubernetes cluster, you can define your own custom resources. I have an example here with API version in starnow.com v1 alpha 1 kind demo. Metadata is actually uh, similar to what you have with built-in resources. So I have the name here, and as soon as I apply it to Kubernetes, Kubernetes will also put a resource version there. And then I have a spec, which is basically arbitrary YAML. And if you want to define your own type of custom resource, the thing you need to do in Kubernetes is you need to create a custom resource definition. And this custom resource definition is only to announce the metadata. It does not describe the structure of the, the YAML in the spec that you want to create, right? You just say, I announce a new kind demo. It has this group in stana.com. It has this uh, version v1 alpha 1 and, and things like these, okay? It does not, like, it's not like a schema describing your YAML structure. Good. So, and then what do you do with these custom resources? So, how does an operator work typically in the, in the real world? So, um, let's get back to this distributed key value store example that we had in the beginning. So, if you wanted to write an operator for a distributed key value store, the first thing you would do is to come up with a YAML structure that you can use to describe the, how your key value store should be configured. For example, like, um, I don't know, how many instances you want to have, the replication factor of the data, the sh uh, sharding algorithm, or what, whatever you want to, to, to have configured there, right? And then um, you uh, create a custom resource definition to allow users to create instances of your own custom resource containing this configuration, right? And then the user can go ahead and just create an instance of this custom resource, can say, I want to have, like, with replica uh, with uh, five instances and data replication factor two and stuff like that, define it all in some YAML, and then apply the custom resource to the Kubernetes cluster. And in the cluster, you would have your operator sitting, and this operator would list and watch, not pods like we had in this example, but this specific type of custom resource, right? And whenever the user creates such a configuration, the operator gets an edit event, the operator sees the configuration that the user has applied, and the, user can, uh, the operator can start setting up the key value store accordingly. For example, as the first step, creating a deployment. And then as the second step, starting to list and watch pods, because the operator would want to be notified whenever like a pod in this deployment is deleted and replaced with a new one, and things like that, okay? So it all starts or it all is triggered with an initial custom resource that the user will create. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you how to go from listing and watching pods to listing and watching your own custom resource type. So um, first thing you do, you write a Java object model um, where you can deserialize this custom resource into. Um, for this, uh, the library uses Jackson for this, which is a well-known like Java annotation thing for deserializing YAML or or JSON to, to Java. So I have the, the code actually prepared. Um, so if we look at, at the model that we that I have here, fortunately all the metadata with um, name and resource version and, and things like these are the same for all custom resources. So you don't really need to model that. You just extend the custom resource base class and inherit all the fields that uh, all resources have. And so that basically leaves you with modeling your spec. And if we look into the spec, we see in, in, in my case, it's pretty simple. It just has a simple, a single JSON property called demo properties, which is modeled as a set of string, right? Maybe one uh, curious thing, this uh, register for reflection up here, 
Um, Jackson uses reflection on these uh, model classes, and if you want to compile that to a native executable, you need to tell the compiler that on runtime you want to use reflection on this, and in, in Quarkus there's an easy way to do this, just put this annotation and then things will work. Um, if you just compile to an executable jar, you won't need it. Okay. And this is basically like a, a standard object model. There's a little bit of boilerplate that you need because you need a list class, which will be used as the result of list operations, but you don't need to implement anything. It's enough to just extend the uh, base class custom resource list, and you need a, a, a dunnable class that also doesn't need to do anything. You can just extend the custom resource dunnable. And then we can go ahead in our client producer. So you remember this one here produced our default client that we can use to deal with built-in objects like pods and deployments and things like these. And we can now create a client to deal with our own custom resource. Um, it's actually just three lines of code that you need. So the first is you register a custom kind. Kubernetes deserializer, register a custom kind. So whenever you see something with API version in stana.com v1 alpha 1 of kind demo, please deserialize it into the demo resource class. Okay? Uh, second step is you load the custom resource definition. That's uh, the thing that I just showed you a few minutes ago. That's easy. You just... Uh, say, custom resource definitions list, which of course gives you all custom resource definitions. And in this example, I just take the first one because I know in the demo I just have one single custom resource definition. And so, so that works. And then you say, uh, with, with the, the default client custom resources, give it the custom resource definition as parameter and, and these three class files in, uh, that, are, uh, that implement this custom resource. And yeah, and that will return your client. And if you now look at the changes needed to this lister watcher thing, it's actually really trivial. So I replaced the client with the custom resource client, and that's basically it. You still have a list operation, but now instead of returning a list of pods, it returns a list of demo resources. You still have a watch operation, but instead of watching pods, it watches demo resources. And apart from that, it's pretty much uh, the same code as before. Um, let's try it. So I, I actually al already um, compiled it in order to not to lose too much time. So I can just say kubectl edit deployment operator example. Okay. And the, the thing that we built previously um, was in this Docker image with uh, tag version 1. And I can now just change this to tag version 2 in my uh, deployment descriptor. If I say get pods, that will trigger Kubernetes and terminate my old version and start a new version with the, with the um, new example. And now I can say kubectl logs minus f for this uh, new version. And now if I just say kubectl apply minus f my custom resource, then immediately I get an edit event, right? And yeah, this uh, output here with the spec is because I have a nice two-string method in my in my demo resource class, and I also it also prints the the name and the resource version. So so this seems to work. And if, for example, the user decides to change the uh, to to change the configuration, you can say kubectl edit edit um, what was it called demo hello world, right? And for example, add an e and an f here. And immediately, as soon as, as soon as I apply it, I get a modified event and get the updated configuration. And if I say delete demo, hello world, I immediately get a deleted event. And that's basically all the, all the building blocks that you need. I mean, you can now go ahead, write your operator, listing and watching your own custom resource that you defined. You can, like in Java, with standard Jackson annotations, have an object model representing this configuration. And as soon as somebody add, adds or, or modifies one of the resource, you do whatever you want to do. Maybe create a deployment for, um, maybe create a deployment for a key value store, or maybe then starting to list and watch pods because you want to be notified if a pod in that deployment dies and is replaced with a new one, or things like that. Um, actually, maybe maybe as a as a as a um, Last word, um, there is, so what the API I showed you is kind of a low-level API in this uh, Fabricate uh, Kubernetes client. And I have heard that there is currently work going on defining 
an even more higher level abstraction of this with classes like a shared index informer and things like that. So I, I didn't try it, and I don't know if it simplifies things, but um, especially if you, if you watch this on YouTube and it's three months from now, maybe before you start using the low-level API, you could check out if this shared index informer actually saves you some work, and if so, you might go ahead and use that. But if not, I think it's, it's, it's pretty easy even with this low-level list and watch operations, and I think it's pretty easy to understand what you're actually doing. And yeah, it runs stable. You can compile it to a native executable, get a pretty small Docker image to, to deploy it. And I think it's, uh, Java is, uh, has become a great language for writing operators. So time is it's all, all, even more than 30 minutes now, so I think there will not be much time for questions, but I will stay here for a few minutes, so if you want to ask something, just approach me, and thank you for listening.